Good afternoon, I'm Mark Hubbard, the Educational Liaison with the Tennessee Association of People with AIDS, and I'm pleased to be here at CROI with Jared Baton from the University of Washington in Seattle and Dr. Stephanie Cohen from the uh, San Francisco Department of Health, and we're going to talk a little bit about PrEP this afternoon. Both of these researchers are highly acclaimed in the field, but just as importantly, they have great relationships and are engaged in the community, and we see them as advocates and activists as well. I'll start by saying that um, we had two very interesting sessions on PrEP yesterday, and I think it was important to note that the tone was very different than it might have been in previous meetings. In the morning, I've been calling that session the PrEP rally because there was so much enthusiasm for getting PrEP to people who need it now. But we also were sobered a little bit by the afternoon session where we had pointed questions from people who are still skeptical. Do you two want to share your ideas about how we're going to bring the community together and where we are right now? on bringing PrEP into prevention as we know it. Sure, thanks Mark. Thanks for inviting us um, to talk today. I agree. I think that the morning session really, um, there was a ton of optimism around PrEP. And I think that, um, you know, what we're seeing here at this quarry is for the first time we're really not just talking about does PrEP work. Everyone has accepted PrEP works. We're talking about how do we make it work and how do we get it into communities. Um, I work with the San Francisco Department of Public Health and direct the municipal STD clinic there. Mm -hmm. And we're one of three sites in a PrEP demonstration project um, with another STD clinic in Miami and a community health center in DC. And we've been offering PrEP to men who have sex with men and transgender women for the last year. And we've really found that people want PrEP. Um, they don't necessarily have access to it currently. But once you build a system where you can deliver PrEP in the community, we've had a lot of demand and very high uptake across the three sites, um, across race ethnicities, across age groups, um, and other demographics. So I think um, really, and there was, has been other data presented at Croy illustrating this high uptake as well in, in a lot of settings. For instance, Jared's demonstration project in Kenya and Uganda, 96% or some, so of couples who were offered PrEP um, chose to use it. So I think um, we know PrEP works and I think we're, what we're starting to see is that people want PrEP and we need to figure out ways to get it to them. That sounds very good. Did you want to add to that, Jared? I, I, want to, I think I want to reemphasize and thanks, Mark, for organizing this. Uh, it's what a change this is this year from one and two years ago at Croy, where the discussion was much more mixed about whether this was something that, that, that worked at all for people. And now it's really how to make it work in the real world, how to get it out to, pe to people who, who want to use it and who, and who will use it. I think the, the, the morning session that you talked about, it's not just that the enthusiasm was there from the people on the stage or the people who give the talks, but that the room Exactly. And the people who ask the, the people who get up and ask questions, or the chatter in the the chatter in the room, and the chatter after that session, was no longer about confusion about whether this is something that works to, that works for people or that works or, for, to prevent HIV or should it be used at all, but really trying to get into how to make it have an impact in the world, how to get it to people who want to use it, and how to help them to use it really well. Super, super encouraging. Yeah, I found the same thing. It's really reflective what I'm seeing even in Tennessee where we don't have uh, much in the way of programs to deliver PrEP. We have a small program with young black MFSM in Memphis, mm -hmm. but we held a forum last fall and we really had hit a tipping point. Rather than me going to the community and saying, I want to talk about PrEP, two young guys in the community came to me and mm -hmm. said, we need to do a forum about PrEP. It was wall to wall. People were coming out of the closet mm -hmm. that they were uh, either looking at PrEP or starting at PrEP, it's just a big tipping point. And mm -hmm. I've gotten a whole series of communication since people disclosing that they've started PrEP right there in Nashville, even though we don't have a clinic or a program. Mm -hmm. And how good it is to have a, have a push from the community in that way. And mm -hmm. uh, one, of the, one of the most exciting and pointed moments of the morning session was after a, a, a very nice descriptive study of, of of HIV incidents and who's getting HIV in Atlanta and really incredibly sobering news about very high incidents among young black MSM in Atlanta. And part of the questioning being, this is really important to document, 
but it's no longer important just to document this. Why is the world, why is Atlanta, why is the U.S. allowing this to happen when there is an effective intervention that could be stopping some of this? Right, right. So let's talk about a little bit uh, specific sessions or papers you might have seen in this way that are shedding new insight, leading the way on where we go with rolling prep out, that kind of thing. Can you think of anything specifically that was a highlight for you? Well, uh, there are... There are I think, I think that it splits along sort of two big directions. There, there's implementation of PrEP and some really encouraging data from uh, Stephanie's work in, in, in San Francisco, um, uh, Miami, and DC, DC thank yeah. you, um, where there's a, an open demonstration project and such high demand for peop when people uh, have access to PrEP and then really good initial use. Mm -hmm. Always been the has been the question with prep whether if people take it away will they actually use it? But the initial data look very encouraging mm -hmm. that when given access, the people who want prep actually demonstrate that they do want it. Um, also, really encouraging data we have data as, as you mentioned from from Kenya and Uganda where the initial uptake has been has been really encouraging, and then some nice. Uh, review talks, and including in that afternoon symposium, mm -hmm. talking about what demonstration the projects might look like worldwide, and the kind of, and some information for communities and providers about how best to um, to prioritize those who might really need prep the most right now. And that's I think that's all very encouraging. Mm -hmm. Then the second part, so that's part of the implementation. The second part is new things for prep, and there has been a lot of, of attention to new prep agents. Um, new prep medications, including injectables, um, injectable prep agents, and uh, the one that got the most attention this year was uh, uh, GSK 744, um, uh, injectable that might la have lasting duration for a month to three months of HIV protection, and had very good. Um, what was very good? There were two uh, abstracts presented that demonstrated it worked 100% in protecting mm -hmm. monkeys against HIV. <clears throat> And also encouraging data about uh, an intravaginal ring containing a medication called depivirine. That medication is in actually already into phase three trials in, in humans. And the encouraging data were for some laboratory data reinforcing that it might work really well. I think those are really encouraging in thinking about um, what we might have in two or five years. And it reinforces what a great pathway we've already set up with, with starting to get PrEP out there with, with the oral forms and how hopefully in two and five years there'll be a bunch of choices available to people. And if we can make real headway in the next two to five years with implementing what we've got now, how we can really hit the ground running in five years when the new things are ready. That makes a whole lot of sense. One thing I run, run into, and I think, Stephanie, you might be able to illuminate this with your international work, is folks in the U.S. see this as uh, a product that's only going to be available to rich white men. And I remind them that this product wasn't invented uh, with resource rich countries in mind. It was really invented in a search for something to help women who need a choice in resource limited settings. Can you talk a little bit about what that looks like for po folks who are not inside the research? Well, I will say most of my work is domestic. So I'll, I'll defer to Jared on okay. some of the questions regarding um, providing PrEP access to women in resource limited settings. But I can say that, that in the US and in the demonstration projects, including ours and others that are now off the ground and rolling, we're seeing a lot of interest across race and ethnic groups. Um, it's not just something that white and um, wealthy educated men are coming in, in and asking for. However, we have seen that being white and wealthy and educated is a predictor of knowing about PrEP and knowing about PrEP is important for actually coming in and seeking it. So we, we do have a lot of work to do to actually increase PrEP awareness across communities of men who have sex with men, um, because we know that that awareness, although it's not um, required for PrEP uptake, we actually had people who came into the clinic who'd never heard of PrEP, but upon being educated about it and told it was a prevention option, they chose to use it right then and there. Mm -hmm. So you didn't need prior knowledge of PrEP. But prior knowledge of PrEP certainly helps in encouraging the, the PrEP seeking. Um, so I think I, I completely agree with what you're saying, that this is um, a prevention tool that's needed across diverse populations, both in the US and, and abroad. OK. I, I, I might, to some extent in the US, I feel like our 
biggest gap right now is is the is the knowledge mm -hmm. of prep gap the, 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 that there as much as we've worked hard to do the science right we are lagging in being able to get the information out there yeah. that this is something that exists just that it exists right and and then how to and then how to get it mm -hmm. and if if we collectively as advocates right. and, 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 and scientists and, and community members can work on bridging that gap, mm -hmm. I think we're going to we go a huge way. Yeah, I think it's an essential phase in this whole kind of dissemination of an innovation. Like you mentioned, um, the, the increasing kind of awareness and interest in Tennessee, and we need key opinion leaders and community members to be out there talking about PrEP, tweeting about PrEP, blogging exactly. about PrEP so that folks hear about it. Um, and one thing we saw in our demonstration project was that across all three sites, including our Miami site, where prep awareness in the community was quite low compared mm -hmm. with San Francisco and DC, but across all three sites, the number of clients who were coming into our clinics asking for PrEP increased steadily throughout the study period. And we know some of that was because of our very own study participants going out and talking about it and saying, hey, I'm using this and it's working for me and do you know about it? And that word of mouth is, is so crucial. You know, at the same time, I think I want to caution that there's, it, and I don't know how this is playing out in the um, resource limiting setting, but there's stigma in the gay community around PrEP as well. Sure. So some of our participants are also facing that and talking to friends who are saying, you're doing what and why do you need that and what does that say? And I think we really have to be conscientious about the fact that that's out there and it's real and it can be a barrier and we can't ignore it. Um, I mean, I think we need to try to understand the roots of it and, and really, I think, getting people talking is one of the best ways to fight that stigma. Well, and I think that extends not just to the community, but to providers. Absolutely. We certainly run into a lack Absolutely. of knowledge among providers and sort of quoting, you know, medical school dogma about mm -hmm. resistance and infection. And so we really needed a concerted efforts. So I think it would be great to get the AIDS Education and Training Centers mm -hmm. doing regular training on PrEP across the board because I think that's going to make a big difference. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And we've heard that from participants as well, going to their doctors and saying, hey, I'm doing this. And their doctors either haven't heard about it or they have a reaction that um, whether it's a, a, um, with facial expressions or right. body language or words, our participants feel like that was not something that was accepted. And that's a problem. I think the, the getting doctors in, in all settings, you know, CROI is, Croy is, a, is in many ways a very specialized mm -hmm. meeting. I think many people here are very, obviously people come here because they're very knowledgeable about HIV. But this is an intervention, this is the kind of intervention, the kind of medication, the kind of tool that really would, would be great to percolate out into lots and lots mm -hmm. of different care settings. To really the kind of primary care places where people engage in care, engage in care that they're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. It's great to see developments in San Francisco, D.C., and Miami mm -hmm. in these specialized clinics, but, how, but rolling into other places mm -hmm. where everyone can get mm -hmm. some message about this and, and get some access to it. Yeah. And kind of just one other comment on that, coming back to some of the science, one of the posters that was presented from Ken Mayer's group from the Fenway mm -hmm. um, was based on a big survey, something around 9,000 MSM who are accessing an online um, social networking site. And um, he was looking at how many people had ever used PrEP and what were some factors associated with prior PrEP use very small numbers had used PrEP. This was about, um, the survey was conducted, I believe at the end of 2013. But one of the things that predicted PrEP use was feeling comfortable talking about sex with your doctor. And that's a two-sided street, right? It's not right. just that me as an individual, I feel comfortable. My doctor has to make it a comfortable setting to talk about you know, your sex life and what you do. So I think there, there's a number of provider issues around knowledge, stigma, um, sexual history taking that we have to work on. Well, and what I'm really trying to incubate in, in my region is cooperation between those doctors who may not have time or may not be as competent right. with that kind of 
uh, counseling, mm -hmm. testing, adherence counseling, mm -hmm. to work with the local ASOs and build partnerships yeah. so they can share that load. It's mm -hmm. certainly it's part model. of the solution. Anything else you two wanted to add? I think we would be remiss if we didn't remind folks that there's a myth out there that it is difficult to get prep paid mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. and that we are getting great reports anecdotally that people are being able to access prep. I got a, 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 a friend of mine started blogging about his experience taking prep this week and the drugstore was actually very proactive in helping him to access both pre-approval for his insurance and a discount card for his copay. Right. So the community is coming together on that. I think it, people need to know that that's out there. The other thing I will say in the community that's going on that's very old school and reminds me of the early days uh, in the gay and bisexual men community in the early days of HIV, we're compiling lists of supportive doctors. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it'll be long before we start sharing those lists so people will know yeah. where it's safe for them to go and uh, get this information and get supportive help. Mm -hmm. That would be incredibly useful. Yeah. So I just want to thank you both for generously t sharing your time with us today. I think this is a really important topic. I look forward to seeing you at the next CROI. Thanks, Thank Mark. You.